Welcome to everybody who has signed up to this webinar uh, session, the first of some amazing uh, programs that we have generated by the Michigan State University Museum in collaboration with the Michigan Traditional Arts Program that are appended to an uh, incredible exhibition that is um, was launched at the Crooked Tree Art Gallery in Petoskey in collaboration with the Little Traverse Bay Band of Odawa and now is at the MSU Museum. So um, my name is Marcia McDowell. I am a professor at Michigan State University, also a curator at the Michigan State University Museum. I wear many hats. I'm affiliated uh, faculty member of Residential College of Arts and Humanities, with the Department of uh, Arts, um, Art, Art History and um, Design at, at the university. And I also had the state's traditional arts program. So um, in many ways, those titles intersect in this particular program tonight. And before I even ask our guests, our special guests tonight, to introduce themselves, I do want to do a land acknowledgement because if anything, this is a program that that we must state that Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg, which is the three fires of Confederacy of Ojibwa, Adawa, and Potawatomi peoples, and the university actually resides on land that was ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. So it's important to realize that these programs emanate from a place that is now connected with actually the program that we're, we're doing tonight. So um, this is, as I mentioned, a program that is in affiliation with an exhibition called Kindred, uh, the traditional arts of the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa. Um, it will be on exhibit now at the Michigan State University uh, Museum through July 30th, 2022. And this is the first of four programs, all Zoom, all remote uh, in this time of the pandemic. And um, the, this, the, the ones following tonight's will be uh, July 6th, if you want to take note of these dates. It will be on building, accessing, and using the contemporary Anishinaabe collections of Michigan State University Museum. And I have to say that this was a um, reiteration of a program that was done when the exhibition opened at the Crooked Tree Art Gallery as a Zoom program as well. But I think um, hopefully we've got a little better rendition now that we had our first practice run uh, last year. The second pro, oh, and that program is Wednesday, July 6, uh, 7 o'clock p.m. You do have to go on and register for the event just in case it get, you know, for any reason it might get canceled we we will be able to let everybody know but also because we want a record of who attends these programs the next program will be on july 20th 22 and 2022 and it will be a conversation with a family of contemporary anishinaabe beadwork artists who all have work in the exhibition and it's a wonderful family grouping, uh, sisters, nieces, um, and it'll be a lovely intergenerational conversation about beadwork in their uh, life experience. Lastly, will be uh, July 26. It will be a conversation with just two of the artists, uh, both of whom are Michigan Heritage Awardees, uh, Yvonne walker Kishuk who is a porcupine quill work artist and Renee Wasson Dillard, who is multi-talented, but especially in uh, finger weaving. So um, those programs are coming up. Uh, you will have to register again, and um, but you know, please take note and put them on your calendar. It's a great way to spend this summer. 
So with um, that, I'd just like to turn to some mechanics of this program tonight. Uh, the I just want to let everybody know that this will be recorded, and we hope to put it on a YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, the re, um, and I do have to thank the funders, which includes the Michigan State University Federal Credit Union, uh, and then also the Michigan Traditional Arts Program. Um, there will be a couple of students who will be helping to facilitate the Q&A, which will be at the end of the program. So, you know, save your good questions, uh, post them in the Q&A, and uh, Matt and Sarah will be um, plucking from those and uh, posing them to our two uh, panelists tonight. And, um, and then I think that's it in terms of logistics, except to say that you, all of you who are participants in this webinar, you know, you will not see your faces. So the focus will be on myself as the moderator and our two special guests tonight. Okay, I think I'm at the point where I'm going to do introductions. And as I've already alerted our guests, I'm going to let them self introduce. And so I will start and, and I will preface this by saying that the two of them were co curators of this exhibition. So I think tonight's conversation will be um, sort of what I've been describing as pulling the curtain back from what goes on in developing exhibitions and what you know what does a curatorial process mean and um how how do museums or art centers collaborate with community partners and i we've got uh, the two guests and i have talked a little bit about some of the things we'd like to talk about and so um we hope to cover all of those things but then again if you have questions Make sure you put them in the Q&A so that we can do them, uh, address some, at least some of them, maybe all of them towards the end of the conversation. So with that, I'm going to turn uh, first to Eric, and I will reveal that Eric almost, we almost didn't have this uh, event tonight because he tested COVID uh, positive yesterday. So he's our hero for tonight in that he is here. And um, th so thank you, Eric. So Eric, you want to introduce yourself and then we'll go to Liz. Sure. Um, my name is Eric Hemingway. I'm the director of archives and records for the Little Travis Bay Bands of Odawa Indians. I am from Cross Village, Michigan, and I self-identify as an Anishinaabe Odawa. And I've been working for the Little Travis Bay Bands for Oh, gee, 16 years now, so it's it's getting up there, but I've been in the field of history as a professional for 20 years, uh, but I consider myself a lifelong historian, and I currently live in Harbor Springs, which is different than Cross Village. Uh, might have the same <laughs> zip code, but we're, we're not Harbor Springs, so, um, but no, I, it's, I'm a historian, storyteller, story collector. Thanks, Eric. Liz, you want to introduce yourself, please? Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Liz Erlewine. I'm visual arts director at Crooked Tree Art Center in Petoskey, Michigan. I uh, curate, design, um, and organize and facilitate exhibitions for our Petoskey location as well as Traverse City. Um, I've been with the organization for four years now and um, just really excited to be here to talk about this project with you. Okay, well, um, I've got some prompts. Uh, to kick off the, the conversation, which, as Eric said, I think prior to this becoming live, you know, is we're considering this a conversation more informal and, you know, we it's not a um, academic, it's really just a conversation to sort of reveal, you know, what goes on in collaborations and, and museums. So um, either one of you can start this off, but what was the initial idea? How did this happen? You know, did you go, you know, did you meet up at a coffee shop somewhere or like, where did an idea for an exhibition happen first? 
Uh, I'll start this one off, okay, Eric, because I think it was on our end. So really, I have to give credit to the exhibition uh, beginning, the origins, to a uh, local art appreciator and collector, Ali Maldonado. So <laughs> I had been on staff here at Crooked Tree for maybe a year uh, when a local community member, again, avid art appreciator, reached out to my colleagues actually saying, hey, why don't you guys come over and see some of these things I have? Um, I was new to the region, uh, completely ignorant about the Anishinaabeg artwork of the region. And she uh, brought me into her home and um, shared this work with me and my colleagues. And even though I will completely confess that I was not coming from a point of expertise with this particular kind of artwork, I could tell that there was a story there, that there was something really phenomenal that was happening skill and craft wise, um, but even more than that, that this was a, a really um, rich story to bring to our community. And because I was looking at it with fresh eyes, I figured, oh, uh, I can't be the only one who, who wants to see this and doesn't know this and has, has questions. Um, but also I very quickly realized how can I tell this story, right? I've already told you that this was brand new information to me. So I was not in a position to, to tell that story. So I, I had to turn to Allie and say, okay, you've got something here, but yeah. now what do I do? Where do I go? And she said, well, you got to call Eric. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what I did, Eric. You can go ahead and pick it up from there. Well, there was certainly lots of cups of coffee, though. We did have a lot of conversations <laughs> over caffeinated drinks and yeah, she just called up and said, hey, I, I met Crooked Tree, and this is who I am, and this is an idea, and it really just started from there. And so I, I really give her the props and the credit to just reach out to a complete stranger and say, this is what I want to do. And, you know, Liz is always honest and forthright about what, what you know, the mission is. We got the, these objects. The objects are really driving the story. They're just so good. How do we get them out to the public? And We've done other exhibits, especially at Crooked Tree with, with Odawa Art in the past. And you know, how do we do, and Liz brought this up, like how, what's a little different spin we could put on this to um, just make it more enticing, a little bit different. And so it just snowballed from there. Like we started talking about you know, beadwork and paintings and contemporary art, traditional art, and just going back and forth. And then COVID hit. And then we just kind of like, well, let's just take a little hiatus and you know do our homework. But let's, you know, we intermittently kept in touch and we did, we were sending ideas back and forth and meet, meeting when we could. So yeah, Allie is a big part for having this, you know, be a, a real exhibit, but then I also want to credit, you know, the items themselves that they were just there and then just waiting for the story to come out through them. And once we started to bring these items out, it was just like a flood of just, you know, just really choice pieces, whether it's beadwork or, or quill work or weavings or paintings. It, it was an embarrassment of riches at some point. We had to start turning things away and we kind of took over both galleries. So um, in my mind, you know, it started with Allie and Liz, but really and also as the items that we're, we're trying to get out and tell a story too. Uh, yeah. I love that you say that, Eric, because um, I don't know about you, Marsha, you might have something to contribute to this too as a curator. Um, I'm not sure that any of my projects have developed in the same way or in the same path. For Eric and I, I, I would say this was very organic. And um, what he mentioned just there about, um, about the objects telling their story, that was an interesting back and forth. Eric bringing this uh, cultural knowledge, but uh, historical expertise to the table and, and those like actual chronological stories. Um, but I'm so used to building a display based on objects. And, and how do we how do we kind of coexist and bring those two pieces together? And I think that that's one of the things that was really successful uh, in, in bringing the show together was um, letting the pieces sing as their own um, element and their own piece because we have amazing artists in our region who have created phenomenal work. I mean, you've mentioned several of the names that were key for the show, but there are several more uh, on display. So these beautiful objects. Um, but I knew when I looked at them at the first time, you know, first time I looked at a quill box, I thought, oh, okay, this is a phenomenal object, but but what, what am I looking at? And then once you place that, uh, that history and that cultural context, they really become something else. 
Well, already I have a, a prompt that wasn't even on our list of prompts because, so Eric, you, you mentioned that there had been exhibitions of Adawa art at Crooked Tree before. What, what is different about this? What could you speak to the difference of this particular experience? I think the scope for one, we, we covered you know, paintings by David Shinaniquit. We had the beadwork from Stella and her family and the quill work, not just from Yvonne Walker Kijik, but from Manitoulin Island and other private collectors and the weavings and the black ash baskets. And we have a large birch bark canoe that's over hundred years old that was on loan from the Little Travers Museum. So just the, the scope of the, the variety and the age of the items too. So we had things that were well over hundred years old to things that were made that year all within this one space. And then we also wanted to use the art to reflect time. So we were have certain objects filling in, you know, this is what was going on with the Odawa 50 years ago, 70 years ago. You know, these items are used as economics to feed families and pay bills, but also sustain identity. But the identity changes a little bit through time, but it still remains at its core Odawa. And then also just giving more of this broad backdrop of who the Odawa are. We had a large timeline that went around one of the galleries and people maybe maybe not have known that we were here in our own belief system, you know, since day one or that we went through all these turmoils to be in this homeland. And part of the turmoils is, you know, the connection to land and environment and resources that we had to stay home for a lot of reasons, but the resources was a big one and the resources were taking care of us and through a lot of different means. So I think that was different. And then also just how we went through this tumultuous time period with COVID that it could easily have died out that we could have just threw the head in the ring and said, you know, we're losing steam. We can't get people together, but Liz pushed on, I pushed on and uh, we got, you know, a, a nice core group of artists together. And just the, the ideas were really the synergy. I want to say we, have like another exhibit planned already out of this uh, with, you know with, well, go, you know that was one of my prompts so go ahead speak to that well i mean it's just an idea but that's how it all starts right the idea mm -hmm. and we were really you know talking about tattoos and, and you know <laughs> body art that it's traditional that has been tattooing them th themselves for thousands of years and it's making a big resurgence uh, but not just odawa or not, not just odawas but all native people but um, also with clothing, we're seeing a lot more native people in, you know, incorporate oh, traditional designs into baseball caps and shirts. And so they're really starting to own contemporary clothing with native design. Uh, so we're something just to think about um, in the near, in future. Yes, Eric um, obviously has access to these phenomenal archives and some um, we were a little bit able to include in this rendition of the exhibition, some of these illustrations and old images and we were inspired by that history of the body art and and, and one version that was going to be part of the show but we had to tell ourselves we, we can't do it all <laughs> so so it's yeah gonna gonna be there you'll just have to wait <laughs> well that's one um potential outcome you know in in terms of you know continuing relationships but um do you have other uh, specific ideas. One is on body adornment or or clothing, and uh, yeah, anything else. Um, I've been excited uh, through the process of building this exhibition to connect with the artists and experts um, here in um, in the Waganoxing Odawa area. Here, um, you know, with with Renee Wasan Dillard. A true expert in her craft and uh, a researcher. I mean, you'll get a chance to hear from her in one of these programs, um, but just the research that she does to identify um, traditional practices and techniques for weaving and how you can carry that through family lines. So I've been in conversations with her about putting an exhibition together. Um, the Crooked Tree Art Center, uh, we describe ourselves as a community center based in the arts. And um, through this exhibition and through these collaborations, um, we now have open doors to, to bring some of these artists in to, to teach. Uh, Becca Lynn taught for us. I'm talking with Stella about teaching with us and just keeping these practices alive. So all of that came from, from this experience and will continue to grow.
So how, how were the artist voices factored into the, um, the, the thinking about the planning of this exhibition and then the implementation? Can you, maybe Eric, you could start with responding to that. Well, a big part of this was putting Liz in touch with, with the artists and you know, finding individuals who were still practicing and which isn't that difficult in Waganuck scene, thankfully. And, mm -hmm. But then, you know, laying the groundwork for all these relationships, like, you know, I don't know how the relationship's going to go. I was like, this is the person you need to talk to, Liz, and I'm pretty sure they'll, they'll work with us, but you never know. Mm -hmm. um, but thankfully, everybody did, you know, and it, it turned out really well. And we were having just such, we had items that were from private collections. We had items from the artists themselves. We had items from other museums. So it was a real variety of where the items were coming from and incorporating the artists we had I think on the opening weekend all the artists were there you know doing demonstrations and there was videos of the artists throughout the exhibit um, so it was it was a real I think it was a, a juggling act at times of how do we fit all these different elements and stories into this um, because we also had the natural resource element too and that was part of the videos of how some of these resources are really fragile, like black ash is almost gone and these sicknesses hit the trees and overdevelopment and water quality. So that was a, a small portion of the exhibit, but something we were, thought we had to tell. You know, one, one of the things, and I, Liz, you can jump in in, in a moment, but um, you know, in, in the museum world, uh, there is a, you know, a lot of concern, a lot of discussion about decolonizing museum practices and also making sure that there's indigenous perspectives. You've already alluded to how that um, was uh, addressed in this particular exhibit, but can you expand on that, those two, that notion of decolonization and indigenous perspective in this? And, where you think you succeeded and where you'd like to go further. Um, yeah, that, I mean, yeah, either one of you. probably have things to say to that. I think to me, um, in a position where I'm asked and, and have the privilege of putting exhibitions together for public consumption, right? I think it's recognizing that, that I am lucky enough to, to choose what's gonna go into that space and bring things to the audience. And then, um, you know, constantly reminding myself that it's not my voice that everybody needs to hear all of the time, right? And so how do you, how do you kind of put that, that aside and, and, and work towards opening it up um, for others to take control over what is being said or how that story is told. So for me, you know, obviously um, working with Eric and, my, and, and other collaborators on this was key. Uh, I think that it could have gone further for sure. I mean, I still um, had a lot of creative voice in how the final exhibition came together and, and I'm proud of that work. But I think that there's more that, um, that artists could be involved with that. A lot of the um, direct artist voice happened through our programming and, and giving um, stage and space for artists to to talk about the work that they have done and to tell their own personal stories and how it connects to the themes. Eric, can you add to that or elaborate? Yeah, I mean, in in my mind, having indigenous perspective from step one is decolonization. That you're not setting the narrative and then ninety way through the project, you come back and say, well, can you come in and put your stamp of approval on this or check a box for diversity or inclusion that we're, we're here from day one, literally mm -hmm. over a cup of coffee, you know, thinking and brainstorming and putting our resources together and pulling our strengths together to make this happen. So, and we're having this incredible, like I keep coming back to the word synergy where it wasn't this, I'm gonna take over and, and, you know, make sure it's one way or the other that, you know, we realized what we both brought to the table. And when we knew we needed to, you know, go to other resources, such as the artist. I'm not an artist. I can't do anything with art. So we brought the artist in and Liz just did some phenomenal design work and how the thing set up and people were commenting, like it just flowed and how the colors and where things were placed. And, it, you know, it's just things I'd have no expertise in. And I was like, well, that's Liz's world, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what she did. So, I mean, having 
equal partners is is a big step in decolonizing. Yeah, and and you were actually the the person who crafted most of the text, correct? Yeah. Yep. So you know your voice was front and center throughout the text panels, should I say? And then you had those amazing videos uh, that allowed other voices to flow into the gallery um, of the artists and community members, which was lovely. Yeah. Well, when, yeah, I want to do a shout out when, when we mentioned the videos, um, I, I just have to acknowledge some folks. So um, yeah. those videos were made uh, by Spencer McCormick uh, with Tribal Partners, uh, and he shared them for the exhibits. So uh, really glad that, that those pieces existed. And then um, Dewan Jordan of Alpine Media helped us create some custom things, um, uh, especially of Yvonne uh, walker Kishik. Uh, telling her stories and, and watching her assemble boxes. So just a thank you to them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, and I, I should note that in terms of uh, collaborating, um, LTBB, Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa, does not have themselves an exhibition space or museum. So, um, and this is one of those ways where you look at, well, what resources does each partner have to bring to the table to make something together special? No, um, that's that's my world, Marcia, is partnering. And I, you know, any success that I have is with partnership, whether it's you know state parks or a local you know, art center, what have you. And we just bring to the table what we have. We have an, a really truly amazing archives. You know, we have over you know, 4,000 images, hundreds of thousands of documents. So we can really put some, some things together in a lot of different ways. So I'm really blessed to you know, inherit this responsibility and, but then use it in a, in a pretty dynamic way and having you know, a local place. Or I remember as a kid you know, going to Crooked Tree for programs and they used to have ghost suppers as part of a community program there a long time ago. So this partnership goes back, you know, decades within the community. So it wasn't this, you know, newbie relationship or our first time. It, this goes back quite a ways. So it's kind of rekindling that connection between the tribal community and the art center, which felt really nice. And it felt pretty, pretty natural to go into that building and do these things. It didn't feel out of place. And so hopefully we can you know, keep the momentum going and do some more stuff in the future. And, and I will, as a segue also is to say that and I didn't say this at the beginning, but the Michigan State University Museum has a long relationship of working with LTBB um, uh, in terms of documenting cultural aspects and helping with uh, federal recognition and projects that will, you know, I think, you know, we have many years of working together. So it wasn't a surprise to be able to even suggest having the exhibition at Michigan State University because there was already a history of working together. And also uh, the MSU Museum working with Crooked Tree. So it's like, you know, the, the, the circles in the pond expand. Hey, so are there any things that you would have done differently? Or if you were to do this again, you know, would you do some things differently? Um, I think there's any project that I do, I find things that I would do differently. And, um, you know, some of it comes down to, well, how did I format and print those labels, right? Little details that maybe only I would fuss over, right? There's things like that. Um, but I think um, I, I'm really proud of what we accomplished. But if we'd had, and maybe this is always the case, if there'd been more time, you know, just a, even more of an opportunity to, to connect with artists and think about how we can dig a little deeper. Um, when I was telling people about this exhibition, I sort of thought like, oh, well, it's, you know, a little bit of an Anishinaabe 101 or Waganak Singodawa 101. And, and by the time we presented the exhibit to the, to the community, I knew more and, and I wanted to take it to that next level. Yeah. I realized after watching visitors move through the space that it was right where it needed to be. Um, but I think that there's just so much more to talk about. So it's exciting to think about ways that we could do that. Yeah, that's cool. Eric, anything to add to that? I mean, I mean, always as a writer, like 
words, you know, I, I could have said something differently, could have, yeah. you know, used a different phrase or a different image. I mean, that is constant. It's never, um, mm -hmm. never set in stone. As my mentor, uh, Jim McClurkin said, you just got to put it down <laughs> at some point. So that's always there. But, you know, being around town and on the street, running into people, they just were just glowing about this. They said wow. this was one of the best exhibits they'd ever seen anywhere. And so that really confirmed like, okay, we, we did what we needed to do. It was, it was real, um, not just gratifying, but relieving, but also like we, we hit the spot. We were like, Liz said, we were, we needed to be. Mm -hmm. And people just, you know, strangers, complete strangers on the street saying, hey, you're the guy that worked with Crooked Tree on this. And, you know, we took our kids there and we spent time, we read everything. And, you know, they were just amazed at the pull that we had with the objects. And so, you know, 20 minutes later, we're still talking about the exhibit on the, <laughs> the street corner. So that's when I knew, yeah. yeah, you can only do things different, but overall, I, th I think we, we, we hit it on the mark. And like they said, it was this temporary exhibit. It was only there for a pretty short time, actually. So we, and then I can't stress how COVID just kiboshed this thing. We just didn't talk for almost a year. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> Liz emailed me one day. It's like, we're still on, right? I'm like, yeah, for sure. You know, when we can like get in the same space together and talk. Yeah. So yeah. that really stressed things, but it, it worked. Yeah. Well, you know, um, one of the things about um, I'm aware of that in the past exhibitions about Indigenous peoples usually cast uh, Indigenous cultures as something historical. I think one of the, the things I, as an observer to this, having been at the opening of your exhibit and now getting to see it here at Michigan State University, is that it deals with contemporary living culture. It, it says, no, we're still here. And not only still here, um, we've got dynamic uh, uh, traditions um, and art forms that are even pushing you know, the, the, the edges of what that tradition is. And I think there are a number of um, examples of that kind of art in the collection. But I also think that a number of exhibitions in the past didn't append names to the objects. They were just a quill box by an anonymous maker. And in your exhibition, you have said, here is a contemporary person, this is their name, they made this. And um, I think that was, I took as one of my takeaways, it was a really wonderful thing to see happen. I don't know if either one of you could comment on that. Um, it never occurred to me not to put <laughs> the names of the maker on there, um, but, but I do hear what you're saying. I mean, we have a, a number of nice examples from Frank Etowagishik and mm -hmm. um, what a joy it is to talk with Frank. Um, and he would talk about how he has pieces in this museum or that museum, you know, unattributed because it's just an illustration of the practice. It's not a recognition of his uh, creative output. So um, that's what I have to say to, to that part. I'll, I'll <laughs> let Eric talk. <laughs> well, I would be... I just ran out of Emmett County if I didn't put names on these. I mean, they would not, it wasn't, it's not happening. It's, it's name first, and really it's name first, item second, because uh, these people are so active in doing this. So, but it's not just with themselves, it's through their family. You know, mm -hmm. with Yvonne Walker Keisha, it's her kids and her grandkids are all part of making quill boxes. And the same with Stella and Becca and all them. It's his family uh, cultural trait. Mm -hmm. So that was never, ever even in the, the lexicon, like it's, you have to put the families because it's so much part of their you know, communities. So that was um, something that I, I never think about, but also um, provenience, like making sure that we recognize Goodhart, Cross Village, Harbor Springs, Petoskey, but then also give an indigenous name, you know, um, Optawang, Onomatikamek, Wikwadonsing, Zupmukwadzibing, you know, we had that in there too in a map of the native names of these places and trying to incorporate as much native language as we could and then you know like you said some of this stuff i guess you'd say push the boundaries you know with how art's being interpreted but that's art i guess and you know we had 
you know, all these wonderful paintings from David Shinaniquit, and phenomenal painter. Uh, he recently passed, unfortunately, but to, to get his artwork on loan from tribal council, that's Allie. She had, she's a judge, so she can, <laughs> she can ask those questions to get a loan. But that really set the exhibit off in my mind because they were stunning and so colorful. And mm -hmm. I don't think people, you know, think of, you know, Anishinaabe or native artists in this contemporary world of, of painting, uh, but Dave set them straight. Yes, and I, I should note that those unfortunately were not able to be loaned to the installation of the exhibit in East Lansing, but they are amazing. Uh, David Shinnecote was an was an amazing um, artist. So, I can I just need to interject one uh, lovely story from um, watching folks move through the galleries. Um, so those pieces, you know, on display typically in the in the courthouse and just a generous loan and as Eric mentioned a unique opportunity for us to bring them to a wider public audience in the galleries. Um, and I was in the galleries when a young family was looking at them and I heard the grown up speak to the child and say look, these are our paintings. Mm -hmm. And that notion, you know, when I come from a world of the commodity of art and we all just own our precious little object and the idea that you could collectively have this creative body of work and share it as a people was really beautiful. And I just wanted to relay that. Thank you, that's a lovely notion. Um, so what has the impact of this exhibition been on each of your you know, realms of work. For you, uh, it's the Crooked Tree Arts Gallery, uh, Liz. For Eric, it is the, um, you know, the tribal government and your your community of LTBB. So either one of you, can you speak to the impact this particular exhibit might have had? Either one of you can jump in. <laughs> I always go first, so I was going to let Eric go first. Oh. <laughs> I'll go first this time. Okay. It impacted me with remembering local. And, you know, a lot of my partners with the state and the feds and, you know, it's all over the place and that's great, but it's like we have partners right here in our backyard and not mm -hmm. to forget that where, you know, your, your neighbors. And this, I've, I've done a couple exhibits similar, but not so art heavy. And to see, you know, the possibilities and that have this opportunity to tell history and story through these objects was really eye-opening for me. Um, it broadened my horizon how I could look and use an object or a piece of art in, in a better way when I'm out doing my work. And then also, you know, I have a partner now with Liz and Cricket. I always have, mm -hmm. but now I feel a lot more comfortable calling Liz up and, you know, it's running ideas past her or, or whatever. So that is a big you know, impact on me. And then, like you said, Marsha, I work for the tribal government and anytime we can get out and partner with, with anybody, uh, this is a good thing to say that we're, you know, it dispels stereotypes and myths about tribal people that were, you know, tucked away on a reservation and we can't, you know, interact with the public. And, you know, I have people still think we live in teepees, you know, that past type of mentality, but to say, you know, we're a professional, um, organization that can do these things with our archives um, that goes a long ways. Thank you, Eric. Liz, I'll toss it to you. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the experience changed me personally and professionally. Um, you know, I had to confront a lot of my my ignorance and maybe biases I had no idea that I had or assumptions that I was making. And so it was a, a really great uh, learning process for me. Um, and it was a good, one of the things that was a was a big takeaway was also recognizing that so many of my partners are whether they want to be or not, they're placed in this position where they have to do all this education first anytime they go to collaborate with someone. And Yvonne Walker Kieschik talked to me about that. I said, you know, I expressed my gratitude for her explaining all of this past. And she just said, oh, I know every time I partner with a new person that I have to start here from square one, you know? And um, so I think a recognition of that was, has been really profound and, and will stay with me. Um, like Eric said, this, this notion of, of staying local, I mean, in the work that I do, I'm constantly trying to figure out how do I find that balance from uh, of showing creative voices from outside the region, from inside the region, and all of this. And and sure, there's there's this this notion that ooh, we're not expressing diversity, uh, but in this region, 
oh my gosh, there's been so much overlooking of the rich history. I, I mean, maybe to me, maybe that's because I'm new to the community, but um, but this, this idea that there's this very uh, involved and rich cultural history that's unique to to our place, uh, you know, has really been uh, profound. And and it's nice now that you know I brought a, a group of fifth graders through the galleries not long ago, and I said, hey, does anybody know why we're called the Crooked Tree Art Center? You know, and and get to say, well, we're Waganoxing, you know, <laughs> and it didn't have anything to do with our exhibition at that time, but it's who we are and where we are. So those are just some of the examples of things that I think uh, influence the way that I'm looking at the work that I'm doing here in Petoskey. Mm -hmm. um, this exhibition has, you, well, typically you have not traveled exhibitions. So it's your exhibition that the two of you curated is now at Michigan State University. Um, so what do you think about traveling an exhibit and what do you hope a new set of audience who don't live in your area and might not have, you know, a clue about LTBB and um, its history and quill work or any of the art forms that are in the exhibition. So I don't know, either one of you can start. <laughs> Eric. Oh, uh, I guess this is the basic 101 with any new audience that they realize we're here. Mm -hmm. And that we're a people, a sovereign, a tribe, a, a nation, however you want to coin it. But the Anishinaabe, the Odawa are still here. And this is part of part of our story. You know, obviously we can't tell the whole story in this one space, but it's a start. So people can realize that this is the Odawa. And just like all great civilizations, their story comes through their art, whether it's, you know, sculptures or paintings. You know, we go to these museums in, in Europe and DC and New York City and you know, we say, wow, look at these pieces that these civilizations created. Uh, we, did, we do the same thing to this very day. You know, we just do it in a different manner. So I, I think it can reach people that way. And then also, I just keep coming back to the land and the natural resources that this is all organic from, you know, here. We don't import these resources. And hopefully, you know, this will take that jump into somebody's mind that this needs to be protected. Mm -hmm. and it needs to be protected immediately, not not soon, but right now, whether it's the water or this tree, um, how we look at invasive species, all of this stuff. So I hope that's something that gets planted in people's minds. Yeah, I, I actually even have heard recently, that, and it might have been from Ivan Kishik, um, uh, but the, the fact that even with global warming, uh, like the, the quills, the porcupines, are not, you know, harvested exactly at the same time of the year as they were even 20 years ago, just because global warming. Yeah. So it's like looking at the immediate resources, the water, the woods, the animals, you know, the plants are being impacted either by human encroachment or you know, the large, writ large global warming. Um, but at, that then has an impact on the art. Yeah, and if you, you step off of that and you think about even just the story of the exhibition and how we, how we pass things on from one generation to the next, I guess at the end, what I hope that audiences walk away from regardless Petoskey, East Lansing, um, is this story of perseverance, right, and preservation, like a choice to to protect these things and uh, and a battle mm -hmm. to to keep them alive and going. So, like you said, Marsha, it was very important, and I I think it was an early conversation with you, Eric, who who just said, you know, it's important that that we know this is now, right? I'm I'm wearing Becca's earrings right now. <laughs> these are these are makers who keep these practices going. They evolve, they change, uh, and and it's very alive and it's uh very rich. And um when you look at the stories that that are, you know, feathered through the show and obviously in the things that in the stories that Eric can tell about the history. 
it would have taken just a few different courses of action and and we wouldn't have that you know and and it was something that that was fought for and that should continue to be fought for so um i think there's there's a little bit it's the shows that we eric and i talk about it as a celebration right it's just a oh this is great we can love this but but i do think that there's there is a little bit of a call to action to say mm -hmm. hey you know these things matter and we have choices and things that we can do to keep it going yeah yeah um uh so uh, you have a community of of individuals who've been longtime supporters um and connectors to your uh crooked tree art gallery um is your community uh enthused about this exhibition and um were they now it's our, at our museum but were they enthused about it and did it change connections uh for the gallery in the community outside of working with Eric and LTBB members? Uh, yeah, it was, you know, really positively received. We had our numbers were were really up um, through the fall season and, you know, coming out of, of COVID and, and having folks come through our schools, you know, we were really disappointed that, that our schools couldn't do field trips. Mm -hmm. um, because they were still under restrictions because of the pandemic, um, yet people went out of their way to come and engage. And we were able to also see that impact um, through, like Eric said, the conversations that happen on the street corner and things <laughs> like that. But, uh, you know, we have a phenomenal um, sales gallery down the street, uh, Ward and Ice, and they had an uptick in, in inquiries and engagement because people could go and find out about these things and then, oh, well, how do I, you know, I want one. How do I support this? <laughs> Uh, and so we saw that kind of engagement as well. Um, and we certainly continue to get calls, you know, about the show, um, looking for additional information. So, yeah. Oh, well, I hope the artists themselves have seen an uptick in the sales of their work if they do work for sale. Yeah, I wouldn't know about the sales that happen outside of us. I know that some of the artists were able to have pieces that were for sale through our exhibition and, and we did sell a number of pieces. Uh, some of these artists, their works are in, in such high demand that you're see, you saw pieces on display from private collections mm -hmm. because as soon as that piece is made, it's sold. So, so they don't really have you know, yeah. an inventory to just lend for exhibit. Yeah. So we do have a couple of uh, questions that have been posed. Um, I will uh, read them. And let's see, it says from, uh, let's see, it's so such tiny print on my computer. Uh, Patricia Bender says, thank you uh, for creating this truly wonderful exhibition. Um, and are the, here's her question. Are the geometric abstractions uh, in some of the beadwork pieces based on tribal symbols or, or glyphs, or are they um, the creations of the artists? That sounds like an Eric question. I'll try. I mean, there's <laughs> always the, the artist, the artist's personal interpretation of everything, but this is one of the first things that me and Liz talked about literally day one was what is appropriate what can we put on here? What do you feel comfortable with? And I, I'm really glad she asked that because there are certain symbols that what I was taught, I don't represent the entire tribe. I don't represent everybody, mm -hmm. but just I was bringing my personal experience into this, that there's just certain symbols that are sacred. And so things like um, thunderbirds, underwater panthers, you know, they're represented by these different geometrics. So we tried to stay away from those as much as possible, just not, not to offend uh, individuals with certain beliefs. So when an artist incorporates these, um, you'd have to ask the artist, you know, where they're coming at with this and um, how they're using it. And there was colors that we talked about quite a bit mm -hmm. um, in terms of how the layout, but what are, I mean, all colors are sacred, but there were certain colors that match certain things better. So we were mindful of that. And this is, yeah, like, I think this was one of the first things we talked about because there's some symbols that I felt uncomfortable just putting on a wall. Hmm. Um, so we went with different, different types of geometrics. This is also a way that we were able to let the artists 
make some of those choices you know if if the pieces included these things right that that was where it comes from and what what eric mentioned just now in his comment you know just pointing out like i'm speaking for me and what i know and what my experience is i mean that was critical for building the exhibition was recognizing that as much as i wanted to from day one fit something nice into this little box and say this is right and this is wrong and this is how i'm going to do this is just recognizing that there are far too many nuances and personal experiences with any of this to stay hard and fast. Um, I do encourage you, Patricia, to check out the conversations with the artists themselves because you can ask exactly how they chose to respond to some of those. Um, I am not an expert, as I noted, um, on um, these traditional patterns, but I will say that there are motifs that have been carried down uh, generation to generation. And some of it's just um, like Yvonne will talk about how well, when she learned to make quill boxes, she did Susan's designs. And then as she did that, she then started to evolve into her own um, kind of creative imagery. Um, so I guess it's a little bit of both. Yeah. So um, just take a moment and do a shout out for the programs that you have, that you created. Uh, they were, they're online, correct? Uh, some of the programs that were appended to the installation in Petoskey. Yeah, we did uh, weekly lectures uh, and some demos um, connected to the show. Um, and this would be featured artists like Yvonne, like uh, Wasan, um, Stella, and Vicky, and Regina, uh, and Becca. Some of them spoke about their own creative practice, and others spoke about just creative areas that they were connected with. Frank did a talk. So those recordings are on our Facebook and some of them are already on our website. Um, so you can find some additional resources there. Um, I will also do a teaser that uh, it's it's taken us a while to get it out to the public, um, but we've been working on um, an interactive video um, version of the show that was here at oh. Petoskey that will include a lot of these resources. If you, if you want to see that uh, in the future, we will make a big deal once it's ready. It's Good, good, good. There. <laughs> good. Yeah, because, you know, exhibitions are ephemeral. And so you've done so much great work uh, putting this exhibition together and the programs. It would be great to see it have a life so that it can be used, continually be used for ec education and um, research. Also, both of those things. Here's another question uh, from Kurt Dewhurst, who I will uh, say is also a curator at the Michigan State University Museum. Uh, he said, how, how did the tribal elders and tribal youth respond to this exhibition if they weren't already an artist involved in the um, exhibit itself? Well, from the limited interaction I had with elders and youth who went to the exhibit, everything was positive. You know, a lot of this was family though, too. It's like, that's <laughs> my grandma or, you know, that's, that's my mom or they knew these people um, intimately. So mm -hmm. to have their story and their family and kin in this public place, I think resonated quite well. And also to see these, you know, youth with this contemporary, we had, you know, Becca Lynn, who isn't, I mean, she's in her twenties. And she's making phenomenal beadwork. And I, I noticed your earrings, Liz. I, I was going to say something, but I'm <laughs> glad you did. So there was people, you know, younger people there who were, were engaging. But everybody I talked to was was supportive. They liked it. Um, they were happy to see. But it was also like lightning in a bottle, too. That we could pull all this stuff together, you know, for this for this space. We had quilts. We had, you know, quilt boxes. We had... You know, every, you know, it was pretty amazing what we pulled and people were just, it's kind of an embarrassment of riches. You know, you just go from one space to the other and it's phenomenal work. I mean, Arnie Walker, I mean, he, he's really good, man. He's almost as good as Yvonne. And then you go to, you know, this other space and there's Dave's paintings. And so we, we really yeah. nailed it. Yeah, well, thank you for shouting out about the quilt. That was a loan from uh, Michigan State University Museum. And you, you know, Eric, I have a soft spot in my heart for those. Um, yeah, so we don't have any other questions and we're coming up 
uh, almost five minutes left in our hour. So I just, I would like to turn to each of you and say, you know, you know, in the long view, um, we've already spoken to, you know, some of the things that are already coming out of this, how it's personally changed you, how it's, it's changed uh, perceptions within the community has had multiple impacts, but, you know, in the long view, are there the things that um, you could summarize about this experience and how it's been different and, um, and or, um, you know, what you would like to see going forward in terms of not only your collaborations, but uh, work between indigenous peoples and um, and community arts organizations? Um, I guess for me, Longview is, I, I would hate to see that, oh, we did the Odawa show. You know what I mean? I, I would like to see Odawa artists part of regular programming. And that if you're featuring an Odawa artist, it's not always just because they're Odawa, right? There's so many things um, to celebrate with um, the makers that we have in our community. So I guess long view, that's that's what I'm hoping to see Th through exhibitions, through other programming that we do through through the community offerings that we do collectively. Yeah, I want to echo that, that this is, something I would see as a, a, a building block for future work, maybe not even just exhibits. You know, we work together on educational pieces or sharing a space for a talk or whatever. I mean, again, bringing our resources together. Uh, but on a real personal note, I've known Yvonne most of my life since I was a very young child. And to see her still working and active and promoting the culture and the arts, it's, it's really, endearing it's really heartfelt for me but i also realize that she's not going to be around forever mm -hmm. and, and it's really sad for myself to think that you know this stalwart of our community this foundation pillar you know she won't be here forever but she's passing this on to her kids and their grandkids so that was really refreshing to see that but she'll be quilling up until her last day i have no doubt you know she's, <laughs> she's a, a real just a soldier a trooper and not just in the artwork but in the realm of civil rights and human rights for the tribe you know she's just a real real remarkable woman but to share that space with her i'm always honored about that and she'll and she's always humble about it too she's not somebody yeah. you would think you know they've done all these accomplishments but she's very humble mm -hmm. um, but very straightforward too at the same time well i as it so happens the michigan traditional arts program is working with uh minnie wabanimki who's um, uh, Grand Traverse bands of Ottawa and Chippewa Indian, but she's a photojournalist, very, very talented photojournalist. And she was out this morning with Yvonne Walker Kishik and the rest of the Kishik uh, cool workers, Arnold and, and Kim and all, Jacob, and with a drone uh, up in the sky, uh, as they were get, gathering sweet grass. So it's like this intersection of new technologies uh, capturing this age old tradition of gathering materials that are so necessary for this kind of art. But anyway, I was just carrying all day that image of the Kishik family out there, uh, Bert Lake uh, with a drone above them. No, I know exactly that spot. and. Yvonne told the story at, one, at the program and that I was like five years old, maybe real young. And I hated gathering. It's just buggy. It's wet. It's <laughs> uncomfortable. And I was crying. I was throwing a temper tantrum and, you know, I was screaming, I don't want to be Indian anymore. I'm done being Indian. And she always liked to tease me about that story. She's like, you just can't not be Indian, Eric, you know, it's stuck there. And I know it's, you know, it's good. It's a good, you know, tease, you know, there's good teasing and bad teasing. That was a good tease. And, oh, yeah. I love it. Know, she, yeah. She's just like, no, you can't get out of it. And, but I, I remember that day specifically in Burt Lake. Mm -hmm. So it's tough. I mean, it's not easy to go and harvest these resources, you know, hauling bark is heavy, you know, we were out there in the elements it was, you know, we had a heat index of a hundred today, mm -hmm. you know, they're out there working really hard. So there's, you think of all the work they have to put in to just make that one 
you know, eight inch box. It's, it's weeks of work. Yes. And I think that's one of the things that your videos helped uh, elaborate is that this just doesn't happen. You don't go to Michael's and purchase the, the equipment or the, the materials. You actually have to source them from their source. Yeah. And it takes labor and it takes knowledge about those resources, like seasonal. When do you pick it or harvest it and, and the protocols um, related to that? But yeah, so thank you for sharing that fun little story, Eric. Well, yeah, <laughs> obviously it, it 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 it's embedded in you. Good um, thing you found your spot in the archives. <laughs> <laughs> well, my mom reminds me of it too, pretty often. So, uh, oh, sorry about that. Well, we are coming to the close here, and I I just want to um say that there's one more question, which is an important one. Uh, Ada Skiles, uh, who I know she. Uh, uh, seasonally is up staying up in Petoskey and she asked will this program be archived for later viewing what a great question and the answer is yes so it I'm not sure how long it will take to be uploaded to the Michigan State University um, YouTube website but it yes it will be because it was a wonderful conversation and I, I am hoping that we did shed a little bit of light on how exhibitions are, you know, come about and, you know, what's their seed and how are they germinated and then how do they grow and they sprout and um, what are the offsprings of those endeavors together. So um, I will just uh, say one, you know, if either one of you have one last word, I will give it to you know, the floor to either one of you or both of you. <laughs> Uh, just a quick thank you, Marsha, for putting this program together and the series of programs and really for making it possible for the show to, to come to Michigan State University. It's really exciting to think about it reaching a broader audience um, and, of course, for orchestrating and, and making it possible to borrow some, some of the really strong, phenomenal pieces that we were able to exhibit here in Petoskey um, were courtesy Michigan State University. So uh, that's been a, a long time working to build that collection. So kudos to you, Marsha, and, and thank you. And always thank you to you, Eric. So. <laughs> Eric, last word from you? Well, I just want to you know, really stress to the audience and that this is about respect and, and you know, just treating each other as humans. You know, we, we had good conversation. There was this real understanding that we can work together. And if people ask, how did this happen? We just acted as you know, professional human beings that, you know, it's, it's really simple. You just treat somebody nice and respectfully and uh, be open-minded, you know, and come together with a real good energy and, and desire to do this. And I think that's the, the secret sauce is that nobody was, you know, the, the head honcho on this. So, the, you know, it's like we were very mindful of what our roles were and we kept to those and it just worked. So, I just want to put that out there. Great. Thank you. Well, I will give a shout out also to my colleagues at Michigan State University Museum, uh, in particular, Lynn Swanson, our cultural collections uh, coordinator, Denise Blair, um, director of education, Therese Goforth, uh, director of exhibitions, and our um, director, Devin Ackman, and, um, and Stephanie Plachi, who is in communications and all of the wonderful interns, volunteers, students, et cetera, who put this um, exhibition together and now are helping to host these, these educational Zoom programs. So thank you both. Uh, we'll call it a night and you'll be able to, to see a replay of this on YouTube. So again, thank you all. Thank you all for being here and um, Please make sure for all of you who are participating in this um, uh, uh, Zoom program tonight, make sure you get to see the exhibit. It's a bonus exhibit experience because it was only going to be in Petoskey, but it will be in, uh, in East Lansing until the end of July. Again, thank you all. And with that, I think we'll close tonight's program down.